Hi, today I'm going to be talking about the grenades of the Russo-Japanese War. I assume you know something about the Russo-Japanese War. It was 1905, 1904 and 1905 between Russia and Japan, fought in what's now China. Well, it was China then too. Uh, culminated around Port Arthur, the siege of the city of Port Arthur, that port, and 203 meter hill especially. It was trench warfare with barbed wire, machine guns, and some of the features of later uh, warfare in that they started using grenades. And the Japanese basically needed to take 203 meter hill, so they brought in their big guns eventually and shelled the hell out of it. Once they got up there, they could see the Russian fleet in the harbor and they called in uh, indirect artillery to shell the remaining part of the Russian fleet into the bottom of the harbor. Fascinating, read about it, but this video is going to talk about the grenades or my attempt to recreate them. If you want to collect Russo-Japanese War, good luck, be patient. I've got a little bit of my collection here. It's taken me 20 years to acquire very little stuff, uh, most of it's paper. But grenades, if you want to collect original grenades from the Russo-Japanese War, my advice, give up. I've mocked these up based on what I've found on websites, a lot of Japanese and Russian websites, which I picked up some viruses on. But anyway, let's dive right in. First, a little back. So grenades had been in the arsenals of all the European powers for centuries since Napoleonic times and before grenadiers comes from that I mentioned that in my other videos here's a mock-up of a of a they were basically cannonballs with fuses uh, and but they were considered antiquated uh, in the early 20th century and retired from inventories they came back in the Russo-Japanese war as I mentioned it devolved into trench warfare and much like we saw in the beginning of the first world war uh, if you're a student of the history of the first world war and grenades they started out with stuff like this, soup cans uh, filled with high explosive and shrapnel. Uh, the difference was they would use what they called uh, a, what we call now a safety fuse, waterproof internal burning fuse, and uh, high explosive, TNT, dynamite, or the names they use for that kind of explosive inside with a blasting cap in, in, uh, in Port Arthur, they had a lot of industry, and so they raided their stocks of explosive they used for mining and the construction of the port and fortifications to start fabricating grenades like this originally. Now, if you believe what you see in movies, uh, I've never found a photo of one, but the Japanese apparently used bamboo with high explosive inside and uh, a burning fuse uh, to start with. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that. Not sure what it looked like, never seen a picture of a real one. I guess they wouldn't have kept them. Again, the difference being they were filled with gun cotton, which is nitrocellulose, uh, an explosive, or a mixture of gun cotton and other high explosive. And again, it would have needed a blasting uh, cap to, to set that off. It wasn't black powder like in the Civil War. And then, that's my creation. I won't zoom in. They they did things with field expedience. They started making grenades because they wanted to reach out and touch the people in the ditch across the way. So they took like uh, shell casings and crimped them off, filled them with high explosive, and lobbed those at other people. Now this is probably one of my more well documented uh, reproductions with less speculation on my part. This is an original Krupp shell from 1900, and probably fairly accurate of the type that they would have had, uh, the Russians would have had. And what they did was they, f they fitted up a friction pull igniter um, that would pull out here. I'll try to pull it out without wrecking this whole thing. And that was a feather, like a the quill of a goose feather covered in phosphor and basically it was like striking a match like a friction pole in any other grenade and that initiated the safety fuse which ran up to the detonator which was inside here this one's flared out at the bottom 
that probably isn't accurate, but not inaccurate. They had plugged off the bottom with cement or welded something over it and then filled it with high explosive. You'll notice the size and heft of these things. <laughs> One of the lessons that they learned from the, from the war was they made the fuses too long originally, and they made these things huge. Uh, some of them, you know, four or five kilograms in weight. So you couldn't throw them very far. But uh, this, this one I found quite a bit of documentation on. I'll show you pictures of that. And this is my own creation, very crude. I won't show you much. You can figure out what it is. It's just a shell with a blasting cap stuck in it. They definitely use that. They're still using those in any uh in syria and iraq afghanistan that still gets so here are some examples i found on the internet of current uh use of these and the original use today that kind of explosive it's just an easy way to make a, a bomb that's going to blow up you take a artillery shell and put a detonator cap where the fuse goes and if you can pick it up you can throw it then I get a little bit more speculative, although I've seen pictures of this. The Russians apparently had old cannonballs around, and they've uh, cannonballs being shells instead of solid balls, and they filled them up with uh, explosive, put a fuse on them, and I found a picture where they had this kind of device on it, which I guess allowed them to throw it. Along the same lines, here's another. Uh, the Japanese apparently also cannibalized, well, they cannibalized a lot of things to make their grenades. Uh, neither side made grenades in factories and shipped them to the front by the time the war ended. They were all made in theater, either in workshops in Port Arthur. There were three separate uh, workshops going in Port Arthur that created grenades. And the Japanese had them nearby in, in Dalian, and then uh, the field engineers were making them. Uh, they had soldiers started it, but then uh, the command realized that uh, it was a good idea, and they started making them according to certain patterns. This is a little speculative. I saw something like this on, on a, a Japanese website. The translation wasn't good. Uh, basically, it's a, a collar um, that allows attaching a chain to throw it, and then it is was described as a oil lamp uh, filled with high explosives. So they used cast iron oil lamps apparently in China at that time, and they were plentiful. So they adapted that to uh, a grenade they could throw. Becoming more speculative here, the Japanese also had a grenade that was impact. Um, detonated. For some reason they all tried to do impact detonated grenades and they didn't work very well but uh, a lot of the observers of that war came to the conclusion that the detonate, detonation by impact was superior to time fuses again maybe because the time fuses were too um, too damn long and they threw them back. They were like 9 and 10 seconds some of the early ones and uh, you know high explosive safety fuse what you do is just you know, cut it to the second uh, you need. It's usually marked. Okay, so this is my recreation of a, a drawing I saw on a web, Japanese website of a grenade uh, with a percussion fuse. Um, it would be pretty simple to make this. I won't go into how to do that, but you just need something in there that hits a percussion cap, uh, as in a rifle round. The tail, of course, is so that it lands on its head. That's the thing about a percussion grenade. It needs to land on its head. I should mention that that's just a rifle round right there uh, that they used as a housing for that friction primer. Uh, and then they took out the percussion cap uh, and used the friction primer. I forgot to mention that. Sorry. So at the end of the war, both sides had come up with fairly sophisticated impact grenades. This is my mock-up of the Japanese model. It had fragmentation bands, it had a lid band at the front, uh, it needed to land here, so it had streamers and a long pole. Uh, this, I guess I mocked up a little bit too big and long. I have a picture I finally found after I'd made this uh, based on written descriptions, and it appears that my pole is too long and the streamer should have been at the end. My pole is too long. I hear that all the time. Sorry. Uh, not for kids. Not for kids, YouTube. Okay, so I will show you pictures of the Lishin grenade.
Christian Grenade didn't make it to the East in time to take part in the war close. From what I've read, it was almost half a meter long in its original configuration, had 200 grams of dynamite in it, and it had a fragmentation head. It was a percussion grenade um, that was meant to impact and detonate that way. The safety cap came off before use. Not sure they were very successful. The impact is evident, however, when you look at the British number one and number two grenades, and it had a lot of impact on later grenades in general. They apparently had these in theater, the Japanese, but uh, very late, or maybe they arrived after the war. They kept them, they started manufacturing them in arsenals. Uh, this a grenade very similar to what I'm showing you here in 1905 and kept them in production for about two years uh, but they, they they gave up on them before the first world war and stopped manufacturing them for some reason. So how important were uh, grenades in the Russo-Japanese war? Hard to say. Six percent of Russian casualties to December of 1904 were attributed to hand grenades and that is the same number the British had in the first world war which is kind of interesting. So they certainly made a lot. In Port Arthur, they had three workshops set up, the Russians did, and they were turning out 2,500 a day at their max. It was nowhere near enough. They used over 6,000 in one day uh, at the defense of Hill 203, 203 meter hill. The Japanese uh, created 44,000 in their six month siege of Port Arthur. And that's four divisions splitting that up. So it comes to 200 a day or 50 per division, which is not a lot. But would they have used more? Probably, almost certainly. One thing to be careful of when reading up on this is... In so you'll see in period documents that they often refer to grenades and they're talking about trench mortar ammunition or artillery shells. They seem to be used interchangeably, just a caution there. They did have... Uh, trench mortars that they improvised, uh, both sides did, and I'll talk about that in a later video. It's pretty interesting as well. Okay, I hope you liked that video. I hadn't seen anything like it on YouTube, so I thought I'd give it a whirl. If you have corrections, which I'm sure there are many, or comments, please put them below. I was working with Translate for a lot of the documents I used to try to mock these up. So, you know, collectively, we know more than any one person. Your comments are greatly appreciated. If you liked it, click like. If you want to see a video I'm working on, well, I have the house messed up here with uh, my stuff. I'm going to do one just on uh, collecting Russo-Japanese war stuff in general and look at my small collection uh, as well as what else is, is out there and possible to collect now. So click subscribe. As always, thanks for watching.